Hey, welcome to another episode of Pocket Pulp. This week, I'm excited to read to you Fragile by Misha Burnett. Misha has been writing for around 40 years poetry and fiction, and he has several books on Amazon and on Audible, narrated by the very talented Brandon McKernan and Brandon Casanelli. And I will put links to all of that stuff in the notes. You can also find Misha on Twitter, at Misha Burnett, and he also has a blog, mishaburnett.wordpress.com. Check the notes for the links. All right, let's just dive right in. Again, if you're enjoying Pocket Pulp, I hope you like it, subscribe to it, tell some people about it, drop some flyers from a plane if you have to, whatever you gotta do, we appreciate it. And now, Fragile by Misha Burnett, read by Eric Brian Moore. Fragile was originally published in Asteroids, Stories of Space Adventure. I used to run traffic control on Samothy, a tiny little rock about as far from Neptune as Mercury is from the Sun, and given the title of Moon, mostly for convenience. It was a good vantage point for watching the outer system, though. Back then, pretty much all of the traffic in my corner of the sky was headed to Triton with supplies for making it into another pint-sized copy of Earth, like they'd already done with Europa and Titan and Ganymede. Tucked in a corner of the occasional transport, though, was a package for me. Food and canisters for the air and water recyclers, mostly. I could have been more self-sufficient, but since I was just an auxiliary traffic control station for a construction project, it was easier to plan on resupplying me than setting up a closed ecology. Most of the transport pilots saw making a second stop in Neptune orbit as a pain in the ass and I couldn't blame them. It added a couple of days to what was already one of the longest hauls in the system, and they didn't get much of a bonus for my tonnage. Captain Allison Sparks, of the Leather Stocking, was an exception. She always seemed happy to drop off my cargo before she started the long fall back towards the sun. Leather Stocking to Samothy, she called. You awake, Bobby? I locked in on her transmission and cut in the beacon. I hear you, Cap. You got some groceries for me? Roger that, Samothy, she said. I got 62 tons of pork rinds, special delivery. I laughed. Allison's last trip had brought a load of fetal pigs and suspended animation to Triton to be raised for food for the workers there. She was from Earth and assured me that fried pig skin was a delicacy there. I had my doubts. Like most working folks this far from the inner system, I hadn't much experience with mammal protein. But skin tissue didn't sound appetizing to me, no matter how it was prepared. Copy that, leather stocking. I checked my boards. We have a lock. Assuming control now. Oh, I just love dominant men, Allison teased. She sounded sexy. I'd never seen her face, but her voice was pretty. You got eighty-one minutes to enjoy it, I said, checking my board. So, when are you going to put in for some leave and let me take you home with me, she asked. Ugh, I don't want to let anyone else run my planet. They wouldn't put things away and leave a big mess. Samothy's not a planet, she always said that. It's inhabited. I gave her my usual reply. By extraterrestrial law, that makes it a planet. Hell, boy, I've had dogs bigger than that rock, she said. That is no way to talk to a planetary emperor, I told her. Emperor? A laugh. I thought you were going to set up a democracy. Nah, I got scared I might vote myself out of office. An absolute monarchy seemed safer. So, you need an empress then, she said, that sexy edge coming back into her voice, to ensure the succession. Oh, I've got one, I assured her. You brought her in my last shipment. I just haven't gotten around to putting her together yet. 
Decided that you didn't want a robot on the throne? Nah, it wasn't that, I replied. I just told the factory I liked Asian girls, and they sent me the instructions in Chinese. There's no substitute for flesh and blood, she insisted. Don't knock it until you've tried it. Oh, I've tried it. And she was definitely flirting now, almost purring. It's a long way back to civilization from here. Didn't like it? I teased. I liked it just fine but the damn batteries wore out before I got past Jupiter. I laughed. You know, she said slowly, I'm running over the top on the way back to miss the rings. I sighed and checked the board. Time to get back to work. Allison was going to need a course home after all. The local plane of the elliptic was full of junk, as full as Saturn's rings, just not as pretty. That was the whole point of my station to monitor the wreckage of what had been either three or four normal-sized moons, uh, cosmologists were still arguing that point, before tidal stresses broke them up. So, ships leaving my little world usually charted a course over the pole, and then used Neptune's mass to swing them sunward through the relatively empty space above the planet's northern latitudes. I started the program running the numbers to give her computer. I could stick around for a while she suggested. Huh? I wasn't sure what she meant. Yes, it would be possible for her to remain in Samothy orbit before heading up over Neptune, but why? It wasn't as if she'd be getting a boost to her acceleration for my orbital velocity. I took twenty-five years to get around Neptune. Maybe I could spend some time on Samothy, she said. You know, see the sights? I laughed at that, looking around my living space. Two big spheres and one little one, a dozen meters below the frozen methane surface. From where I drifted in my office, I could see the whole of my bedroom, the other big sphere, and my bathroom, the little one. Well, I said, it's tough to get reservations on such short notice, you know, this being our busy season and all. We could spend some time together, she said and the invitation in her tone was unmistakable. Oh, shit. She was serious. I closed my eyes and scrubbed my face, very gently, with my hands. That's not a good idea, I said softly. I'm not asking you to marry me, she said. Just, you know, have some laughs. Allison, I have... E-O-I, I said flatly. Oh, she sounded very sad. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Of course she didn't know. How could she? I'd never mentioned it. Maybe I should have. But I'd never taken our flirtation as anything more than two people killing time on a long, boring job. I'd been assuming that it was the same thing for her. Don't worry about it, I told her. It's not a big thing. That was a lie, of course. Environmental osteogenesis imperfecta was a very big thing. It almost kept the human race from colonizing the solar system. Today, of course, it seems obvious. But in the system's early days, space medicine was mostly a list of things to avoid. Don't look directly at the sun. Don't go outside without a suit. Things like that. Everybody knew, of course, that terrestrial biology was shaped by the fact that it was terrestrial. Things that live on Earth are adapted to Earth conditions. Simple, right? But the details were fuzzy. When Deimos Prime went truly self-sufficient, it was seen as the biggest evolutionary leap since leaving the oceans back in the whatchamacallit era millions of years ago. The human race was living off the planet, raising food, generating power, making their own air and water, and, in time, having babies. Then six out of ten of those babies died in the first year, and those that survived were cripples. From my perspective, decades later in my vantage point at the ass end of nowhere, it can be hard to be charitable. They wasted years trying to pin down the syndrome to some dietary deficiency or radiation effect. 
there was a search for an infectious agent there in the most sterile environment ever constructed. Some researchers went so far as to suggest that it was caused by a lack of some bacteria or virus common to Earth that they had failed to bring with them to Mars orbit. All the time, the answer was just outside the window, hanging there 14,000 miles away. Gravity. They'd known about muscle and skeletal deterioration from prolonged weightlessness since the first Earth orbital flight over a century ago. Somehow, though, no one thought to wonder what weightlessness would do to a developing child in the womb. I guess they figured that since the baby was already floating in fluid, it wouldn't make any difference. Wrong. These days, of course, a woman who gets pregnant in space is quickly shipped back to Earth or to one of the colonies that has enough spin to provide close approximation of 1G. But they didn't do that when my mother was pregnant with me. By the time that I was born, they had a name for my condition, even though they hadn't figured out what had caused it. Environmental Osteogenesis Imperfecta, or EOI. Brittle Bone Disease. It existed on Earth, but there it was caused by a rare genetic anomaly, which maybe was why they spent so long barking up the wrong tree when it showed up in babies born in space. They could make braces for my arms and legs, and teach me exercises designed to help my muscles compensate for my weak bones. When I reached my full growth, just a smidge over seven feet tall, I had surgery to implant titanium rods next to my long bones as internal braces. But there is no cure. Once the skeleton starts growing by about the thirteenth week of gestation, it's too late to fix it. I'm fine, I continued to fill Allison's embarrassed silence. So long as I stay away from gravity. And acceleration, she said softly. I guess. I nodded. And then, since she couldn't see me, I added, Yeah, a uh, tenth G is about my limit. And people? People make me nervous, I admitted. Because they could hurt you. It's not that I think people want to hurt me, I said quickly. Not on purpose. People aren't monsters. But you're so fragile, she finished for me. I understand. Very sadly. I checked my board. The leather stocking was nine minutes out. Time to suit up. You're getting closer, I told her. I need to go meet the container. I've got an empty for you, too. Copy that, Bobby. All business again. Good. I wore a Waldo 404 power loader on the surface, way more suit than anyone else would need for Samothy's pathetic 1% of a G-filled, but it was the cheapest one on the market with a full rigid exoskeleton. Inside it, I became unbreakable. I had to be careful to make sure I kept the magnetic grapples on, though. The escape velocity of my kingdom was about only 30 feet per second, a good jump could win me an all-expense-paid trip to Uranus on a long orbit. Leather stocking drifted down gently, and Allison cut in her own grapples so skillfully that I barely felt the click of contact through my suit when she locked into place. She was a heck of a pilot. Some tug jockeys slammed into the rock like they were trying to reposition its orbit. The cargo hatch slid open, and I clanked inside. The supply container was nearly as big as my entire habitat, but it was lost inside Leather Stocking's hold. I clipped onto it and slid it out, moving nice and slow as its mass required. I clamped it down on my landing pad, and with a start, I saw the empty container was in motion. I felt a jolt of fear that the grapples had failed, and it was on an uncontrolled skid. Even empty, the container was massive enough to flatten me or even damage the leather stocking if it had any velocity behind it and hit something vital. Then I looked again. It wasn't uncontrolled. A figure in a pressure suit was towing it. Allison? A pilot? Going outside and moving cargo? It was unheard of. Almost easier to believe that I had been visited by some native Neptunium form of life that had randomly decided to make itself known to the human race by assisting in loading a tug. 
But it was Allison. I opened the short-range channel on my suit. You don't have to do that, I protested. I'm wearing a Waldo. Just take a minute, she said. Don't tell the Union, okay? She moved like a flatlander, keeping her body at right angles to the surface as if she were standing up, but she handled the container well. I stood back and let her slide it into position in the hold. She looked good doing it, too. Her body had that heavy roundness women get from fighting gravity all their lives. Her pressure suit was unarmored, a form-fitted second skin that left very little to the imagination. It also, I realized, didn't offer anything close to the kind of insulation she needed. In the shadow of Neptune, we were at the next best thing to absolute zero, and she was radiating body heat like a furnace. Hey, I said, you need to get back inside. Thanks and all, but you don't have the gear for this. She turned to face me before replying, another earthism, and said, Are you going to invite me in for a drink? I thought it over for a second. It had been a long time since I had been face to face with anyone, much less a pretty girl. Fear and excitement battled inside me. Excitement won. Come on, I said. Follow me and keep your grapples on. I went down the metal path to my airlock, thinking over my store of supplies. I could offer her a bubble of wine made from Ganymede apples very sweet, and I had a pretty fair selection of snacks. I was out of practice at being a host, but I could wing it. When the lock was done cycling, I cracked open the Waldo and slithered out. Allison pulled off her helmet and backpack and stuck them to the wall, turned to me, eyes wide. I don't think this is tight, she gasped, grabbing for her helmet again. I launched myself through the inner door and into my living space. Hang on, I told her over my shoulder. I keep the O2 pressure low in here. I'll, I'll raise the mix. She looked dubious, but left her helmet where it was and followed me in. My standard pressure was 600 M-bar. I dragged the slider to a thousand M-bar and heard the blowers change in pitch. Give it a minute, I said. I was already feeling it. Thanks, she said, then worked her jaws as she looked around my office. She was lovely, strong, and lush. I tried not to stare, feeling suddenly awkward. No one other than me had been in this space since the colonial authority techs had built it six years ago. How about some wine, I suggested, and went into my sleeping sphere without waiting for an answer. She was looking at the panorama screens in my office, watching the dance of junk around Neptune. It was an impressive display, to be honest, bigger than most ship's screens, and could be overwhelming. I grabbed two squeeze bubbles and filled them with apple wine. I drink it chilled, which would horrify the Ganymede Vinters Association. When I came back, Allison had a gun in her hand, pointed in my direction. Uh, I said. Then, is that a gun? She nodded, then cocked her head to the side. Not that I really need it with you she said thoughtfully. All of a sudden, she was a whole lot less pretty. I floated in the doorway, my two bubbles of wine in my hands. Why? Well, I could just break you with my hands, couldn't I? she replied. No, I mean, why are you pointing a gun at me? I asked. It didn't seem real. Not the gun, that seemed very real, it looked just like the ones that the colonial authority cops carry, but I couldn't figure out what she wanted with me. Is this a robbery? Because most of what I have was in your hold until half an hour ago. You could have just kept it. She stuck the gun back in her thigh pocket. She was right. With her 1G muscles and my brittle bones, there was no way I could fight her. No, we're just going to sit here for a couple of hours and do nothing. I don't get it, I said. She glanced at the display on her suit forearm. Two and a half hours, then I'll be gone. She looked over at me. 
I really am sorry about this. I had hoped that I could just... distract you. I took a drink from one of the bubbles of wine. Oh, she smiled, but I didn't find it as fetching as she'd intended. May I? I tossed her the other bubble, and she snagged it. After she'd had a sip, she said, You're right, this is good. What happens in two and a half hours? I asked. I leave, she said. That's all. She looked up at my system display again, and then I did get it. Samothy was positioned at the far edge of Neptune's ring system. I had a view of every possible approach to Triton, and any ship, coming or going. That was the whole point of my station. Allison, or someone she was working for, wanted to do something in Neptune's shadow without anyone knowing about it. Planning on hijacking a supply ship? Probably. There were hundreds of millions going into the terraforming project. Which meant that no matter what she said now, she couldn't afford to leave me alive when she left. I knew too much already. I was only alive now in case someone called me and she needed me to answer it, to keep anyone from getting suspicious. Unless I did something about it, I had two and a half hours to live. I caught her eyes. She was looking intently at me, watching me work it out. I forced a smile. I needed to make her think I believed her fairy tale about leaving me alive and unharmed when she went back to the leather stocking. What would I say if I did? I see, I said slowly. Any chance of getting a cut of the take? That was the right answer. I saw her face relax into a smile. Something might be worked out, she said coyly. What did you have in mind? She answered me quickly enough to let me know I had been right. She had no intention of letting me live. I drifted a little closer, took another sip of wine. I hoped it would keep my hands from shaking. Well, I don't need much, but if this comes back on me and I lose this job, I could use a nest egg. Her eyes were cold and for a moment I thought I had gone too far. Then she nodded. Fair enough. I can have my friend set up a bug-out account for you once the job's done. I glanced up at the screen, and then deliberately turned my back to it. Facing her, I said, That'll work. So, you want some lunch while we're waiting? Again, that smile, warm and seductive. I wasn't buying it, though. Sure. That would be nice. I went back into my sleeping sphere, thinking furiously. She'd never let me get close enough to my comm panel to put out a distress call. Automatically, my hands went through their motions, throwing some meatballs in the boiler and latching it, connecting the water inlet and pumping up the pressure. Uh, the pressure was too high. Oh, right. I'd raise the ambient to earth sea level standard to make Allison more comfortable. Bitch. I should have cranked it down the other way and suffocated her. Too late now. She'd stop me from getting to the environmental panel, too. And even if I could reach it, she'd just break my arms and reset it. It took time to adjust the pressure. Unless... Then I had it. I didn't like my odds, but I figured it was the only way I had any chance at all. I waited until my boiler was done, and then vented it, Cracked it open and scooped the meatballs into a dish and closed it up. Drifted back into the office. Here, I offered. Thank you, she said. She opened the dish and popped one in her mouth. After chewing, she said, You're taking this well. I shrugged. What else can I do? She smiled. It wasn't a nice smile, but she thought it was. Smart boy. Okay if I hit the head? I asked. She nodded, chewing again. I went into my bathroom, slid closed the door. Then I popped open the electrical panel on the wall. The bus breakers had plenty of current for what I wanted, but I needed metal. Frantically, I looked around. Toothbrush, shampoo, even my razor, all plastic. I spied the knob for the shower. 
if I could get that loose. I pulled, then took a deep breath, braced myself, and pulled harder. I felt a bright burst of pain in my hand as something snapped, but the knob was free in my hand. Wincing, I grabbed a towel from the dispenser to wrap around my hand, then pressed the knob to the breakers, shorting across the biggest two. There was a flash. Smoke rolled out of the panel. A moment later, the strobes kicked in, and a horn sounded. Fire warning, said my computer in a calm voice. Fire has been detected. Emergency atmosphere purge initiated. Allison was pounding on the door. Bobby, what did you do? I wedged myself against the door, but I knew I wouldn't be able to hold it for long. She yanked from the outside. Then I felt her shifting position to get more leverage. I waited until she tugged and threw it open in her face. She went spinning off one way. I launched myself the other. The blowers were howling, drawing streamers of smoke across the office to the vents. She oriented herself fast and pushed off towards me. We collided, and I kicked off hard, too hard. I slammed into the wall and felt ribs giving, pain robbing me of breath. But I had to keep moving. She had bounced off the opposite wall and was headed at me again. Even though she was a flatlander, she was a pilot and used to zero-g maneuvers. I wouldn't be able to keep away from her forever. Fortunately, I didn't have to. She was already gasping for breath. Fire protocol for a station like mine was simple. Pump out the oxygen and replace it with nitrogen, smothering the fire. She realized what was happening and left off chasing me to bound towards the airlock door, heading for her helmet and tanks. I got there first and locked down the safeties, then bounced away again. I was starting to feel lightheaded myself. I hoped that I could stay conscious long enough. Allison passed out before she got the door open. I went to the environmental panel and overrode the fire alarm, set ambient back to 600 M-bar. The smoke was mostly gone. I'd have to replace the breakers in the bathroom, but that could wait. My ribs were screaming at me, and my hand wasn't good for much. That was okay. I could use my good hand to tow her to the wall and use half a tube of hole sealant to caulk her in place. Once it set, it would take a torch to free her. I called Triton, requesting police and medical assistance. Then I ran a scan and located a dull shape, far too hot to be a local rock, hiding in the shadow of Nereid. A ship, probably a tug, sitting with its drive off. Hey, Allison called struggling against the sealant holding her in place, but it was hard set by then. I turned to look at her. I waited for her to realize that she wasn't getting out under her own power. Eventually, she did. She sighed. What happens now? I shrugged. That kind of depends. I highlighted the ship I'd found. I'm guessing this is your friend's? She looked at the display, then back to me. I'm sure we can work out some kind of deal, she said, trying a seductive smile. Don't, I told her, just don't. It's way too late for that now. Her face got serious. Okay, let's talk money. I shook my head. Too late for that, too. There's no way I can trust you. The question is, can your friends trust you? She looked puzzled. I explained. Right now, they're just guilty of failing to file a flight plan and running without a beacon. All they're going to get is a fine. Maybe the pilot will lose his license if they decide to throw the book at him and he's got priors. You, on the other hand, are looking at some serious time for assault. Doesn't seem fair, does it? She frowned. Triton's got a ship on its way. I haven't told them about the tug in Nereid's shadow yet and I won't mention it unless it moves. I figure that'll give you something to bargain with. She seemed about to say something else, but just shook her head. She didn't talk to me again. I spent a week in hospital on Triton. While I was there, they told me that Allison had turned against the others, filling the colonial authority in on the whole plan. She ended up doing her time in a Martian work camp, 
The crew on the tug, on the other hand, got sent up for attempted piracy. Last I heard, they had been sent to the Death Valley Supermax. The CA takes piracy very seriously. After I got out of the hospital, they gave me the option to stay, and I took it. Someone else got to be the emperor on Samothy, and I ran a loader for logistics and supply. Sometimes, at first, it was tough to get out of the suit. I felt vulnerable, exposed. But you can't hide away forever. Allison had taught me that. I went outside with everybody else on O2 day when the atmosphere was certified breathable. It wasn't much of an event, honestly. A couple of speeches and a band and a crowd standing around under the sky. But it was a big deal at the time. It still is when I think about it. After the colony officially opened, I invested in an orchard with a few partners. We do okay. I put on some weight, gained muscle mass. They replaced the human operator on Samothy with one of the new Generation AIs. It doesn't need food or air, doesn't sleep, and nobody flirts with it. I got a message from Allison. She'd served her ten years and got full Martian citizenship, got married and had a baby girl. She sent me a picture of her girl, a cute little thing in a polka dot jumper playing in the sand. I never wrote back. I couldn't think of what to say. But I kept the picture. Thank you for joining us again this week, and I hope you enjoyed Fragile by Misha Burnett. Again, you can follow Misha on Twitter at Misha Burnett, and there are several links in the notes to his work on Amazon and on Audible. I definitely recommend you go check it out. All right. If you're liking Pocket Pulp, I hope you've already subscribed and rated and shared it and all that good stuff. And if you are a writer and you'd like to have your story featured on Pocket Pulp, shoot us an email at pocketpulpsubmission at gmail.com. My name is Eric Brian Moore, Eric with a C, Brian with a Y, and you can follow me on Twitter at Eric Brian Moore or check out my website, ericbrianmoore.com. Music by Blue Mount Score and Eternal Producer from Pixabay. Thank you. For hanging out with me, and I look forward to reading you another fantastic story next week. <laughs>